Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Spokane City Council study session for April 28th. Uh, we are going to have a couple uh, uh, bicycle advisory board interviews, and then we're going to go to the core of our meeting, which is a joint meeting with the park board. Um, and then we're going to have a bit of an update on ARPA RFPs. Um, so uh, let's start with our interviews. I think we're going to start with Christina Ramirez. Uh, Christina is joining us virtually. There we go. All right. Hi, Hi Christina. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we're, I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself and, uh, and tell us a little bit about why you're interested on the Bicycle Advisory Board and what you think you'll bring to it. And then council members may um, have questions or may not. Don't take it personally one way or the other. <laughs> so, but anyway, Christina, tell us a little bit about yourself and why, what you'll bring to the Bicycle Advisory Board. Um, so I have been commuting basically the last 25 years, um, originally in Seattle, but also in Missouri. And then when I moved back to Washington, Spokane, and I commute most of the, the summer and uh, some of the fall. I don't commute during the winter. I'm not that hardcore, but um, I found that since my company moved up north that the bike lanes were a little bit more difficult to navigate than they were when I worked downtown. And so I got interested in how the city decides to design bike routes. And, and so far, my initial, me, uh, attending the initial, uh, the initial meetings these last few months has been really informative. I've really enjoyed kind of seeing the, the way the process works and how I can contribute. Um, it seems like there's not quite as many of us people who commute from South Hill to, to the north side of town, but mm -hmm. there are enough of us that it'll benefit us all. All right, great. What, what route do you use? Um, I tend to um, basically Fisk to the Ben Burr Trail, and then I kind of navigate through Logan District I don't personally love the Cincinnati Green um, Greenway, so I take Dakota, and then I get up on um, mm -hmm. Addison, and then I take that pretty much the rest of the way to my office. And then going home, I have a different route because I do not enjoy the Fisk Hill from Benbur Trail. But okay. yeah, that's, that's my usual commute. All right, cool, good. Uh, questions from any council members? All right, well, we know the Bicycle Advisory Board is one of our more active community boards, and we really appreciate it. And in the six years I've been on council, I believe the Streets Department and engineering have, have made a shift, and they're really embracing it more. So I think you'll have more projects to look at, and that on-the-ground input that you bring is uh, critical. So thank you for doing that. And we'll be voting on this uh, shortly at an official council meeting. You don't have to be at the meeting. Um, but then we'll let you know, and you can officially go to the meetings as a voting member. So we really appreciate it. So thanks, thanks for your commitment. And now I'm going to uh, invite up uh, Michelle Seidels. If I'm saying that right, come on up to the microphone, Michelle. Hi. So same thing. If you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in bicycles and what you think you'll bring to the board. Um. I'm a lifelong Spokaneite, and uh -huh. um, I've ridden a bike the whole time um, in different capacities. So as a wild kid on the South Hill, mm -hmm. just running free or triathlons or commuting to work in the valley. Mm -hmm. um, and I've benefited from a lot of the work that people have done before us. So the Centennial Trail, just so much freedom to go back and forth across the city, and it made it possible to commute to work. Mm -hmm. um, we recently moved from Liberty Lake to downtown, and mm -hmm. so we've been kind of embracing trying to live a little more car free as pedestrians and cyclists. Um, we bought e-bikes last year and so now we're zipping up the South Hill without breaking a sweat and we're just finding our bubble is getting bigger and bigger on our bikes. So I just want to do my part to keep moving in the direction that the city's been going. Great. Great. Any questions for Michelle? All right. Well, th again, thank you. Same speech. Thanks yes. for all your help, and uh, we'll be notifying you shortly and really looking forward to your input. Thank you. Thanks. 
All right, let's uh, move to our park board city council meeting. And until we get our briefing center figured out uh, for the internet, we're gonna keep doing these virtually because it's just a little awkward if you're down here in the audience. So I appreciate everyone uh, participating virtually and uh, especially wanna welcome Jennifer Ogden, president of the park board. And uh, Jennifer and I just spent a couple days together talking about sustainability in Spokane uh, up at St. John's Cathedral and uh, learned a lot and the parks department was uh, well represented there. Um, the agenda, we'll do the roll call in a second here, but the potential agenda is we're gonna get a president's report and then we're gonna talk hear about the parks open space master plan and updates, um, new park board committees, and then we have some topics uh, beyond that, depending on our time. But maybe I'll turn it over to, um, uh, looks like Garrett Jones for a roll call. Thank you, Council President. I think we'll we'll skip on the uh, roll call and then okay. we'll just go into uh, introduction to the board members okay. uh, from our President Jennifer Ogden. Okay. All right. Thank you, Garrett. The um, the park board has a new member, uh, Christina Virgil, Christina Wave, <laughs> and I think you may have seen her little uh, brief in the uh, spokesman review. Something that other board members were thinking was kind of a new stage for park board members, getting all of that press. Uh, we have a great park board. Bob Anderson, the vice president, is not able to be here today, but as I say your name, please wave. Nick Sumner, past president and head of the Riverfront Park Committee. Greta Gilman, head of the Land Committee. Sally Lodato, not able to be here today, but she is head of Recreation. Jerry Sperling, head of the Golf Committee. Barb Ritchie, there we are. She's our Park Foundation liaison. Hannah Kitt is head of our bylaws committee, and Hannah is usually by name because she's working and uh, does this uh, multitasking thing. Kevin Brownlee, head of urban forestry, and of course, Christina. And then Jonathan Bingle, we're very grateful for you as our liaison. I wanted to briefly, and I mean briefly, thank you for all of your support, council members, over the past year for funding for our playground and restrooms for our North Bank wonderful playground there that has turned out so well. The North Suspension Bridge, your partnership there has been invaluable. The uh, stormwater project for Downriver, and especially for your help with our funding for the Don Cardon Bridge. As I said to Council Member Bingo previously, if it weren't for you, we would be spending our entire budget on updating that bridge, and we wouldn't be able to reach out into the neighborhood. So your assistance and support and partnership has been essential. I want to move on to the master plan. We have had great success with this master plan. First time we've done it in 11 years, 11, not 10 because of COVID. We had over 5,306 responses, which is four times more than any other sort of public outreach response uh, on any other project. And it really is a plan that's driven by the public response. It's not something driven by staff agendas. We're really listening to what our public wants to say. And 90% of them felt that the parks were essential uh, to provide their connection with nature and their care of themselves, body and soul, and their participation in their community. They really, that also was an outcome of this recent conference up at St. John's Cathedral. But parks are seen as a solution to many of the mental health and physical uh, health issues in our society. And so this is hopefully the feel-good portion of your day as you hear about all the positives that are coming out of parks. Uh, we have a couple of top-tier things that have come out of top tier projects that have come out of this survey, some desires from the public for enhanced restrooms, playground improvements, improved trailheads. The residents really use our parks for their simple pursuits of walking, spending time with family, walking their dogs, things like that. So the second tier areas are off-leash dog areas, fishing areas, skate parks, disc golf, and a lot of wishes for a public indoor pool. The residents believe that we should have neighborhood access improved to parks by building new parks on city-owned land before renovating uh, existing land or acquiring new land. They really want us to use what we have and to maintain our parks um, as we have them and keep them up to date. Six in 10 residents feel the city should seek additional funding and partnerships to enhance these parks, and they have identified, therefore, the neighborhood parks 
as being most in need of improvement. So we have um, a really unusual park situation here in Spokane. As you know, I think we're leaders in the nation in that we have the best overall distribution of parkland and the most citizen access within 10 minutes of um, a walk to a park. But we have areas, as you know, in the city which are in need of parks, where there's a real density of population, Shiloh Hills up in District 1, the very north of District 3, and this very south of District 2, which are really in need of more parks to keep that 10-minute walk uh, av uh, available to the citizens. So as we look at the four themes, land, water, people, and legacy, there's a framework for how we set our policies and invest in our parks. We're going to be seeking additional partnerships and contributions from the city general fund and from other sources to dedicate to our year um, capital replacement and repair. Um, we're going to be pursuing with you, we hope, a partnership in asking our developers to set aside city land and green spaces as they develop those um, areas for living uh, as green space, as potential park space, because without that, we get that sort of Shiloh Hills density of population without, without access to that public space, uh, that green space that keeps us all so healthy. Um, perhaps that's an impact fee, but maybe that's an ordinance requirement. We'll have to take a look at that. We are looking at a land evaluation, acquisition, and surplus policy change, possibly a, um, a change in the city charter, but we have in the past received gifts from the public, and the park board in the past was in the habit of just accepting those gifts, and some of them are the size of a Ford Explorer, and what can we do with them? They're surrounded by private land, and they're sort of sitting there collecting trash. Um, one of the things that came out of the conference, I was talking with uh, uh, Mr. Howard at Avista, and he was talking about the need for Avista to put in um, EV charging stations. And he and I were discussing whether or not some of that surplus land that we can't use as a park might be a site for an EV charging station. Um, and therefore, maybe parks would get a percentage of that, um, uh, that income uh, to go on forward with, with other park policy and um, capital improvements. But some sort of use of that surplus land beyond just collecting trash and being a liability. Uh, we're looking for key partnerships for a public indoor swimming facility, and we'd like to develop and implement a trail maintenance plan uh, because the natural trails are such a key asset as the citizens look at their use of the city parkland. Um, they really enjoy those trails. Um, some of the potential projects, specifics, are developing Meadow Glen Neighborhood Park on existing city land to improve access to those underserved neighborhoods. Again, filling in those gaps at Shiloh. Uh, prioritize renovation and improvements in parks that are failing due to a poor condition, lacking recent investment. Some of them haven't been touched in decades uh, in the neighborhood parks. Maybe they're located in those uh, social and, e and environmental equity zones that need improvement. And we're looking at a potential future bond as we take a look at what we might need to do to expand our outreach into the neighborhoods. Perhaps the, the, perhaps the bond would have a new park in an equity zone in each district, maybe three major renovations of neighborhood or community parks, three major trailhead renovations, and uh, replacing antiquated park irrigation systems. That's been going on in golf. Perhaps you've had a chance to read the golf report. We've been doing a lot of water conservation as we replace the the irrigation in our park systems. The stream that was in an Indian Canyon wasn't a stream, it was a leak. That has been fixed. Uh, the uh, Japanese pond in the um, Manitou Park was leaking considerably. We have stopped that and that has saved millions of gallons. And so we are always looking for that water efficiency. In terms of next steps, we will be ending um, in May with a final, final public input and revision. The park plan will come to, um, the master plan will come to park board for adoption in June, we hope, and then you all would see it in June, July. Uh, and then the second half of 2022 would be the, uh, the look-see at the investment framework and prioritizing what those next steps would be as we develop that future bond initiative. Um, so that's kind of a dry run through, but Nick Hammond, I understand, is here to show you some visuals if you would like to see them um, to sort of expand on some of these themes. Um, do you have any questions, comments? Would you like to see those visuals? Yes. 
be great. Okay. <laughs> Quick answer to a long question. All right. Nick, you well, want to queue up? I'm glad to share with you some visuals. You should be seeing, and I'm going to pull this up full screen. Can you speak up just a little bit, Nick? Can you hear me okay, Council President? Yeah, now we can. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to pan, pan up here and just show you some really quick visuals on how we evaluate in our park system. Um, I'll be brief, um, give you a couple of those boilerplates that we talked about here. Um, what you see on your screen right now is an action plan or a vision plan for what came out of this document. What you see are several pink dots, which represent new park facilities in existing city land. What you see are several purple dots with arrows or exclamation points, excuse me, which are prioritized sites for investment um, within areas of need in the city. Um, that would include Wild Horse Park, Minnehaha Park, and Cortland Park are, are some good examples there. Um, what you see are several orange dots, which are sort of second tier needs for improvements in park facilities throughout the city. So this, this map is really showing you where we might invest in capital projects. Um, you see these hatched areas here with a yellow money sign in the middle of them. Those represent areas where we see need for acquiring additional land for parks, Shiloh Hills being the most um, important example, the highest level of service potential increase possible. Um, also East Central. East Central Spokane, um, east of Underhill Park, is in need of a pocket park or neighborhood park. So those are a couple of good examples uh, in those locations. Um, would love to share with you these in the minutes. There are symbols for different amenities desired by each neighborhood or district within the city. Um, you see dogs and pickleball panels all over the city. You see sports fields more likely than others in District 1. You see trails more likely than other districts in District 3. And you see in South Spokane, a uh, need for aquatics more than a couple of the others. So those are, those are community desires. Um, and dog parks and, and the pickleball, again, are, are citywide desires. Uh, I'm going to pan through a couple here just to show you some of the watershed analysis that was done. What does this mean? This is, um, this is all of these yellow dots you see are homes outside of a 10-minute walk of the park. So that would be Meadow Glen Park at the North Indian Trail, East Central Spokane, and then as we get down into the Comstock neighborhood. Uh, surprising that you might see some in the Comstock neighborhood, but there are some, some gaps there. As I continue to go down, one of the, the analyses that was conducted was a thorough uh, evaluation of the condition of each facility. And so you see red dots meaning poor condition, yellow and just better than poor, uh, or excuse me, orange just better than poor, yellow being okay and green being good. Um, what, what does that mean? Well, we compare that with these blue dots. And the blue dots here are sites which, the bigger the blue dot, the less money that's been spent in it in the last 20 years. So we went back 20 years to look at all of the capital we've spent in parks. And the big blue dots are cast in parks that have zero capital dollars spent in them over the last 20 years. The smaller the dot, the more the money spent. We overlaid the two of those to come up with a map you see on your screen here which is a recommendation for where to invest capital money. Uh, the, the red dots being a highest priority, the orange dots being the second highest priority and, and on down the line. All of these facilities are facilities which are within social and environmental equity zones, which are historically underinvested in and which are in poorer condition than other facilities. So we do have data to say where we should be spending money in part. We have also, and I think this is of interest to, to many of you, an, a social and equity or social and environmental equity zone map. This was generated using a lot of data to say where in the city of Spokane are there at-risk populations which are in higher need of park facilities than others. The darker the purple color, the higher the equity investment zone potential. So um, we can apply that filter now for investing in park facilities. We've also mapped where we have facilities that are meeting uh, those Northwest trends, pickleball, dog parks, uh, disc golf. We don't have them many in, throughout the t in many places throughout the city, but we do have them in several. And so we wanted to show where they are so that we can learn where we uh, need to enhance them. We've also mapped where we have the highest conservation potential for land. So as we get land development proposals and plats coming in and they ask the parks department, hey, would you 
acquire this for conservation land? Does it have potential for that for you? We can say yes or no based on a very factual set of information and data. Uh, the darker the green, the higher potential for conservation property uh, function, actual habitat function. So that's Laytaw Valley, that's the Little Spokane, that's the Spokane River, generally following our river corridor. Just giving you a high-level overview of each chapter, each chapter having goals and objectives, and not to belabor all of those goals and objectives. We have themes of land, water, uh, legacy, and people. This is really an important Venn diagram to show you, and then I'll get out of the way if you have any questions. Um, there are a set of criteria that we have developed with our consultant and with the public really representing the public's, public's prioritization matrix for, for projects and investment for parks. And those are a combination of, are these proposals in an equity investment zone? Are, is the condition of the park in need of investment? Is there an opportunity for funding? And what is our needs and level of service assessment? And so we should, should and can apply this filter to everything that we do in parks and recreation, whether it be policy, capital, or other investment that we would be interested in making. There are also a number, and I won't show them all to you here, of policy, capital, and guideline recommendations for within our park system, including how developers may need to contribute potentially to make uh, and preserve the existing levels of service we have today. So we have evaluated each of those, including operational shifts in our own operation and how we might better provide level of service to our community. And then that bond program, which I will go back to bring you. So, um, kind of giving you the masterful light, I'll uh, get off the bandstand here and see if you have any questions. So uh, just one note, if you could go ahead and uh, email us the draft plan, that'd be great, uh, just so we could dive into that. But putting that aside, any questions for Nick? All right, very good. I, I've been on that uh, advisory committee to that, so it's been really helpful and how, how deep you all have uh, dug in to get data and applied it and get community input. I've really appreciated that. It's been very good. Um, okay. Um, I guess the one question I had is if we're looking at some kind of bond initiative, what year would that go to a vote? If anyone knows, might be up in the air. Council President, I can and speak to this a little bit yeah. um, from our perspective. Uh, you know, again, a lot of the second half analysis is around the funding mechanism and you know, those action plans and priorities will happen that second half of 2022. Um, right now, we think there's a potential sweet spot window within that 2024 time frame, that would be 10 years since the Riverfront Park Master Plan. Um, that would give us adequate time to be able to finalize what those priority projects would be, um, how we would communicate those priority projects to the public, and then look at that financial plan uh, with the second half of 2022, and then working with all our stakeholders in 2023. Um, but right now, that 2024 time frame seems to align pretty well for us and potentially uh, aligns well with other partners as well in the community. Great, thanks. Um, all right, if any, anything more about the master use plan, that data, otherwise we'll go to the next section on uh, new park board committees and membership and just some highlights on that. Looks like that's you, Jennifer. Okay, yes, we had sort of a freeze for a minute there. Um, so we have um, some new park board committees. Um, those are the Development and Volunteer Committee and its tandem Citizen Advisory Committee that have been created in the past year. And Bob Anderson was not able to be here today, but as you saw in his report, this is a way, again, to have the public have more input into what happens with their parks. And so the Citizen Advisory Committee, we hope it will be made up of, and it's largely full, of our friends of groups, those citizens who have adopted a park and are sort of keeping a watchful eye over that, or adopted a, a recreation specialty such as disc golf or skateboarding um, to be able to participate in park recreation programs and, 
and those amenities with us, those partners. Um, the Development Vol Volunteer Committee then is the actual subcommittee of the Park Board to which these Friends of Groups report through Kelly Brown, who is here today, um, or at least was on the previous meeting. That's where she was. Um, and so um, she's the president of the CAC. And uh, that group takes a look at where the potential partnerships would be, how we can support those Friends groups, how we can coordinate volunteer efforts, and perhaps look for funding uh, partners um, or, or in-kind sorts of partnerships uh, to help move things along. So those are coming along. The King Cole Commemorative Project is a subcommittee of the Friends of Riverfront Park. And that specifically is looking at a way to take a look at the, uh, the Expo 74 celebration coming up in 2024 and asking for an artwork that would be sort of a gateway entrance into Riverfront Park and a King Cole Way that goes through Riverfront Park highlighting those Expo 74 um, themes and, and bits that are left over the pavilion, the theme stream, things like that, the carousel, of course, um, taking a look at highlighting that once again, because that was Spokane's environmental legacy from the World's Fair. Spokane is still the smallest, world's, uh, smallest city to pull off a World's Fair. And in fact, as Bill Young said in his uh, book, it, the Shanghai World's Fair looked at Spokane for a model of how to conduct their own World's Fair. We are in a leadership position still 50 years later, almost 50 years later. So that King Cole Commemorative Project is now at the stage at which they have selected three finalists for that artwork. And it would not just be King Cole, but also take a look at that team that came together to bring that World's Fair to Spokane, and that is proceeding. So um, now I think we can, if, if nobody has any questions, we might open it up to our, our park board members and their topic. Um, we have Jerry Sperling with the Golf Committee. Yep, that'd be great. Jerry, did you want Welcome, to Welcome, Jerry. Right. You bet. Uh, um, I'll start off right away. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. All right, great. Thanks. Um, just, I'm going to do just a quick overview and touch on the bullet points that uh, you have a summary, if you will, in front of you. But uh, right now, golf is currently concluding a four-year, $8 million strategic investment in three of our irrigation systems. Uh, the systems have been replaced at Indian Canyon, which opened in uh, 1935, and Esmeralda, which opened in 1954. Downriver uh, opened in 1916. And that irrigation is 80% complete. And we are focused on the end of May. Uh, we are hoping that that will work. Uh, we have incentives, of course, for the irrigation project uh, and working, of course, with our land management. Um, the investment in these three courses has been upgraded, uh, antiquated, uh, manual irrigation system, some of the oldest. Uh, and improve the customer golfing experience. Uh, the council approved our SIP loan, and that's something I think you'll all remember, except for some of you new people. Uh, and that's being repaid by our golf rate savers. The Creek at Walchen, I haven't forgotten, and that is our youngest course, which was opened in 1993. So growing, growing the game of golf is something that we are always looking at in our marketing regime. And I have listed just a variety of things that will be going on. Uh, but just make note, May 2nd, uh, the Creek of Fulton will host the IE PGA Pro uh, event. The last that I'll close with, and this has already transpired, but uh, golf has made its mark in the Spokane area and the communities beyond. And on April 23rd, it was the date to officially induct Mark Gardner, our PGA Director of Golf at the Creek of Fulton, into the Pacific Northwest PGA Hall of Fame. So we would like to offer congrats to Mark um, and all the pros that are out there. They're doing just a fantastic job. I highly invite and recommend that some of you council members, if you haven't been to our courses, that you take time this summer and just visit. With that, I'll conclude golf. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry.
Um, Land Committee, it's represented by Greta Gilman. Hi, good morning, Council. Um, I have a couple items for discussion today, and they're, they're both related, and they're both related, obviously, to land. Um, the first item is that I believe it's important that we develop a policy for non-park use of park land. During my time on the Park Board and as chair of the Land Committee, the, the Park Board has been asked to approve using park land for non-park purposes. And these requests have proven to be challenging for um, the Land Committee and the, the General Park Board uh, because there are so many, so many um, different opinions about um, these types of uses. And as chair of the committee that often hears these requests, I recommend that we develop a policy for non-park use of park land to help guide park board members through the process of um, approving these types of uses or not approving these types of uses. Um, I believe and am hoping that the park and open space master plan that, that Jennifer and Nick discussed in, in, in very nice detail will provide us with the data and other information we need to devise a policy that meets the needs of park users, because that's really our mission as a park board. Um, and there's an interest, there was an interesting fact on the percent review draft of Park Natural Lands Master Plan, um, which stated that including golf courses, parkways, and natural lands, um, the average number of acres, developed acres per 1,000 people in Spokane is 5.8 developed acres, which is significantly lower than the national average of 9.9 developed acres per 1,000 people. Um, so to me, that says that we need to be very, very careful about what we use our parklands for, um, because we are a little bit low on the capita average for um, developed park land. Uh, and then a related item is park surplus property. And Jennifer also mentioned the fact that we own um, some, a number of pieces of properties scattered throughout the city um, that are not developed into parks and are sometimes um, maintenance issues, not always, but sometimes. And as you know, uh, section 48 of the, the city charter says neither the park board nor the city council shall have the power to sell or exchange any existing park or portion thereof without the prior approval of the electorate given by a majority uh, vote. Um, and so, uh, well, 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 well intended, I think this section of the, the uh, city charter in some ways really hampers um, our ability as a park board to um, manage our, our park lands for the use and enjoyment of all, which, once again, that is our charter. So I'm interested in exploring those two items, and um, if any of you on the council would like to work on some of those issues with me, I would be more than happy, and please uh, get in touch with me about that. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Greta. Yeah, the master plan backs up, Greta, in that the majority of the residents really value conservation and preservation and protection of our natural lands and our park spaces. And as we know, if we, um, we have to have something to preserve to pass on for future generations and keep things from being sort of nibbled away. So while we look for partnerships, we always have to be very protective of our park lands. Um, if it's all right with you, I'll go ahead to the other committee chairs and then we'll have a general discussion and coming back to these issues that you might want to discuss at the end. So um, Sally was not able to be here for Recreation Committee. You have that report. Also Bob Anderson for Finance. Kevin Brownlee with Urban Forestry. Kevin, did you want to say anything to update your, your report? Oh, you're muted, sir. Thank you and good morning. Um, I won't uh, go over the whole report, but in addition to uh, growing and maintaining Spokane Street Canopy, one of the main areas of interest for me that was included in the report was 
the fact that Park Department staff is responsible for inspections on private property and residential and commercial developments. And that was an arrangement made between two directors previously. And uh, I'm not sure that's an appropriate role for Park Department staff, so I'm interested in exploring how to unravel that arrangement and making that inspection function a part of planning rather than the Park Department. So that's as my uh, first initiative I've attended one meeting so far of the Urban Forestry Committee. That's my main uh, area of interest at this point. Thank you, Kevin. One of the other things we've been looking at for urban forestry is to take a look at the assets that we have in our parks as they are botanical gardens, as, as assets for education and from a wider horticultural view of all of those wonderful species that we have. Those Jennifer? Uh, Nick? Jennifer, yes. a quick quick question for Kevin or, or somebody. I guess, what, what are those inspections for exactly? I'm not too aware. Well, and again, it's, it's new to me, but uh, someone else can probably answer more thoroughly. It has to do with the regulations for planting in terms of uh, swales and uh, oh. green space on, on parking lots or residential properties and making sure that the new developments meet those requirements. I see. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't understand why parks department staff would do that on private property. That's that is strange. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Just to add a little bit, Councilmember Cathcart, it's, it's again. I, I think we agree as well as trying to unravel this as, as Kevin mentioned from some pre previous arrangements. A lot of it too is tied around the certificate of occupancy for certain buildings in those final inspections. Um, and again, when a lot of times those inspections are around the health and safety of the public or private use, utilizing those facilities. So it's just finding that balance. And again, I, I, we're happy as staff that this is a priority from, from Kevin on our committee because it does add a lot of extra time and burden. And Parks and Recreation in our world, we're not a regulatory uh, agency. We're a, a support and resource agency. And so kind of getting us out of that regulatory role and finding um, creative ways to help build our urban can canopy, but at the same time being that resource that doesn't stop uh, private or commercial development. And I think taking a look at that issue and, and getting it unraveled will help streamline uh, park staff uh, time and resources and, is, and its allocation of resources a great deal. So I think that's an important one to, to undertake. Uh, Riverfront Park Committee, Nick Sumner, did you want to add anything? Um, I just, I wanted to highlight the good work that John Moog and his staff have done with uh, the park since we've uh, completed primarily the bond construction projects throughout the park and really highlight uh, in the report that I, uh, that we put together, you know, that we're not done, even though we've stopped, you know, we've pretty much completed all the construction projects minus some art installations that still need to go on. If you look for what's going on in 22, there's some uh, great uh, new projects and things that are being looked at, dog park, uh, some more bridge work that's going to happen, red wagon repair and, and upgrade, or not upgrade, but painting and just and f refreshing, I guess. Uh, a new sign in that corner there, just a lot of good things. We're really continuing to look at how uh, Spokane citizens use the park and what can we do to help meet the needs of the growing uh, population and the ever-changing um, uh, needs of, of, of just people and, 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 and really build a park that's going to help us grow into the future. So um, it's an amazing park. It's an amazing uh, jewel for our city, and, and we're continuing to work to, to make it even better. Thank you, Nick. So to wrap up, council members, uh, for your consideration and, and uh, 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 sort of rumination over your coffee, um, the potential bond project, the potential ask for a development policy that encourages or requires developers to set aside parkland when they develop a, an apartment complex or green space for a, a housing unit. Um, the um, joint use asks for parks, developing guidelines along that that preserve our parks while at the same time looking for partnerships that truly do um, add to the uh, experience of park users, but again, being very protective of that park plan so that we have something to pass forward into the future. And then finally, the issue of unpacking permitting, which is not a park function, 
um, from the park requirement from park staff time and putting it where it belongs, perhaps in planning. Those are kind of, to my mind, the four things that are coming up um, uh, for you to consider partnering with us in, in helping us um, unravel and make better. Thank you. Questions. This is what we wanted. Time for questions. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, not not so much a question, just a comment. I guess to me, I, I would not pursue further development requirements, especially right now with the middle in the middle of this housing crisis. Uh, you know, we're already not the easiest place to build, and that's why we're seeing one percent growth, whereas the folks around us are seeing four and five percent growth. And so, we need to make it easier, less cumbersome, less obstacles. My suggestion would be, if we're going to go out for a bond anyway, let's wrap it all into that bond. Parks are are you know, share users across the city. Uh, you know, I live in Northeast Spokane and represent Northeast Spokane, but I do visit Manitou Park from time to time and other parks around our city. And so I think it makes sense that all of our residents would be participating in that and not just latecomer uh, homeowners and renters and make them, penalize them essentially uh, just because they're latecomers. So I, I, would, I would do this citywide and I would do it through the bond or levy or however we're gonna, we're gonna do that. that. That'd be my recommendation. Thank you for that. Um, when you're looking at acquiring land for new parks up in Shiloh Hills, I'm looking right here where it looks like you've got something along uh, Lincoln and Nevada in there. Is that where you were thinking that you'd be putting an, a new park in or do you have a, um, a different idea? Kind of a Nick and Garrett question. I can certainly provide some backup there. Um, yeah, so we would be looking east of Nevada just north of Lincoln is a good large undeveloped area. We haven't approached any landowners um, with a specific ask yet, but that is the general location. Um, we do want to be near the apartment complexes there, um, certainly because there's a large portion of, of individuals we want to try and connect with. So in that general area, I think it's a, it's a good uh, idea there. Um. I was just uh, kind of going back to Greta's point about the requests for use of park land for ostensibly non-park uses. You could, we could quibble over the details of, of that, but Greta, I'm just wondering, and maybe there's more than one, but I'm wondering if the water tower at um, Hamlin Park, was, was that the piece that was causing the most heartburn or, or have there been other ones as well? Just wondering. You're muted, Greta. Sorry about that. Thank you for asking. Um, others that have come for me that I would say cause similar heartburn, I guess, um, have been, for me, as the times that I've been on park board, have been the, um, the sportsplex is an example of, of one where, where we were able to work out an agreement where uh, in return to the land, Parks is able to use the facility a uh, certain number of days per week in our agreement. Um, libraries have come to us and um, charging stations. <laughs> Avista has come and, and asked charging stations on park land and I, and I don't know where where that one has, has gone. Um, so they all, they all, I don't, I wouldn't call it heartburn, but they do create a concern to make sure that we're not just um, death by a thousand cuts at giving away parkland and, and one day we'll find ourselves, wow, we wish we would have still had that piece mm -hmm. um, because there's something we'd like to do on it. Um, and that's why a policy I believe would be, would be really helpful. Okay. Did you, did you have ideas, either you or anyone else on the park board, of you know who you want to convene as kind of a group to develop that policy? Do you want to do it, a, you know, with a couple of council members and park board members, or a broader? I'm just wondering what you're envisioning as far as next steps on that. Um, I love a group of starting out with park board members and, and park staff and council members you know, as a team working together to come up with policies. Uh, others, others on the park board may have different ideas or, or suggestions to that. 
there has been an initial stab, sort of a draft, um, to get things started on that vein. Um, you know, some of us um, feel that there's a parallel mission with libraries, for example, um, or the sports packs in terms of um, the amenities that are brought to the park uh, in exchange for the use of the land. But Greta's right. The, the general approach, um, and I think one of the city engineers actually referred to Hamlin Park at one point as vacant land. It's not vacant land. It's a park. Um, it has purpose. Vacant implies unpurposed and, and almost delinquent. Um, so um, we don't want parks to be seen as available vacant land for development. We want parks to be to be preserved. So we would welcome council uh, input on that. Um, and at the same time, recognizing, recognizing that partnerships um, like the Sportsplex and libraries that bring in additional programming, bring in additional amenities for park users can be good partnerships. It's just a very careful line we have to walk, a very careful balancing act. Um, so we would welcome your input. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah, so I mean, it, it sounds like the partnerships with, uh, you know, the Sportsplex or, or the, um, the libraries, maybe schools, those are sort of accepted. I, I'm wondering what are some examples of some, some areas where there are concerns? I, I'm assuming this is inspired by the water tower conversation, but uh, beyond just water towers or, or those sorts of uses, are there other areas where we've lost parkland and, and that's the instigator for this? I, I don't, I guess my, my concern is um, the way parkland is viewed. It's uh, oftentimes, it's almost like the deals are worked out before they come to us. And sometimes the reason the parkland is picked as a desirable site is because of an assumption that it's not going to cost anything um, to to build on parkland, and I I believe that there are um, that we should be brought in at the very beginning of these types of conversations as a normal land owner. I always like to think, well, if I own this property, is this would this would I think this was a good deal? And I feel like as park board members, we should we represent the citizens of Spokane as the owners of the property, and we should try to get a good deal in in these partnerships. And I'm not trying to say that the sports flex is a bad deal or that the libraries are a bad deal. Um, I, what I'm just trying to say is let's have a policy where we can feel very comfortable that it's a good deal for the citizens of Spokane mm -hmm. yeah. without opinions um, coming into the mix yeah. so much. So there is another example besides the water tower. The um, Avista had approached us about putting maybe 10 EV charging stations mm -hmm. at one of our parks. And, and the issue with that isn't that EV charging is bad. No, of course not. We'd love to be environmental leaders. But is a park an appropriate place for fueling automobiles? Um, that's not a park mission to provide automobile fuel. And um, Maybe it wouldn't have taken up a lot of land in the park, the charging station itself, but the parking would have been impacted for our park users, people lining up to charge their vehicles. That's not an appropriate use of park land, and it's not for park users. You know, we're, we just are not in the business of providing fuel for so if, if the charter, people not using the park. If, I guess my another question would be, if the charter does prevent uh, us from... Um, you know, selling or, or providing these other uses on parkland without a vote of the people. How have we, how have we been able to get around that for the partnerships with the libraries and the sportsplex? And and is that something that that like these EVs, you would have to go to a vote theoretically because you're taking away parkland for that purpose? I, so those are long-term leases, and uh, we are still the owners of that land. Ownership, the title of that land, does not change. It's just a lease. Okay. And so, for example, the Sportsplex is a lease for 60 years. Okay. For $60. It, for $60. It's a dollar a year. Long-term leases for a dollar a year. So we lose the use of the land and for, for basically no compensation. So 
parks have to benefit in other ways. And I'm not saying we aren't benefiting in other ways from those two particular examples. But it, it, um, it would be easier if we had some guidelines and policy to follow when these things come to us. I've, I've got more questions, but I won't take up all the time right now, but I'll, I'll follow up <laughs> offline. And I just want to push back a little bit. The EV stations are for park users. That's what they are. I mean, lots of places have EV stations for their users who have EV vehicles. So maybe 10 at one place pushes that. Um, but I, I just see it if people who have EVs and want to use the park, that's where they would park. But I think the point that you've made, Greta, very well is – it should be early contact and engagement with the park board to say, because I've certainly, in the time I've been on city council, seen people come up with ideas and then say, oh, yeah, we'll just use that park land as if it's just uh, easy. So I get that sentiment, and, um, but it sounds like it's more of a process than a definitive piece, although the other piece is at some point, I think we do need to maybe go to the voters with a charter update on these on these issues is is a 60 year lease for $60 is, is that the spirit of it or not and also how can we get rid of these small plate things I mean there's just some things that need to be there and I'm particularly interested if we could change the language that would allow us to do it as a package deal right now we have some limitations when we go to a vote that it has to be one subject and so if you have 30 little partial things that you want to dispose of, you know, do you have to have 30 votes on it or can you do one vote and things like that? So I, I just think there's some things that we could um, work with on that. So I think that's worth going. Councilman I, Cathcart. Yeah, I'd be, I'd certainly open to those conversations. I think it would make sense to think about a charter update. I, I'm wondering though, the $60 for 60 years is, couldn't, couldn't we have just simply insisted on something more? I mean, it's our land. Couldn't we have insisted on a greater well, we did. We got very good use of that land that wasn't being used anyway. So we have a, a value that's just not cash. It's use of okay. the building. So I think, and Greta was, I remember, a leading voice in negotiating a good arrangement for us. But at the end of the day, we felt like we were getting value for land that otherwise was pretty underutilized. So, um. And if I could, Council President, you know, typically, um, you know, as, as a sports pex example that was purchased during the 1990 bo uh, 1999 bond for the use of uh, like a science center type facility um, so there was actually some bond language too as far as that type of use for that facility and you know typically as well when any type of these proposals come uh, to our desks um, we what we do and even though it's not legally binding we do a lot of LOIs so whether it was the libraries or the you know, sports plaques, we'll just come to the park board with a simple letter of an intent just to kind of outline those type of arrangements before we move further in any type of formal agreements uh, that would ultimately need park board approval. Um, and that's just how we handle it. I think um, our methodology too, a lot of times, if we see the joint benefit between programming and use and joint use, between facilities that we'll just bring it to the park board uh, for discussion to have that uh, rather than it sitting on one of our desks or uh, being dead on arrival that we just have those conversations up front. Yeah. And I will say that to me, the water tower was very attenuated and um, council led um, part of the effort to move it, not into that. And so we reached an agreement with the school district and some people, if you live in that neighborhood, you're like, well, it's, same difference to us, but it was technically different. It wasn't on park property, and the school district owed us a lot of uh, goodwill for all the property that we have given them at no charge, and so it, it, it came down to it. But I just wanted to point out that I thought the water tower location seemed to be outside the, the bounds of the typical joint benefit, even though I'm sure there would be a little bit of watering. Well, there's not watering at that location, so for other, other locations, but... Um, so that's good. Um, any other issues that were kind of mentioned of potential future conversations that people wanted to flesh out anymore? Councilmember Sorry, Bingle. I've just been thinking through the EV charging station since we talked about it um, at the parks. And my only thought there is, because you're right, people with EVs are using parks. I get it. Um, but then if people are coming there and charging their vehicles, is the parks department paying for them to be charging their vehicles there? 
No, I think it, a Vista is providing oh, okay. that the things. Thank you. Um, and it might get more people to use parks. Uh, you know, got a half an hour to charge your vehicle, you can go enjoy the park. But, um, but I, again, if you're talking ten at one location, that might be a very different uh, experience than <laughs> than that. You're on mute again, Greta, or at least we can't hear you. We didn't get that. But um, we asked if this to come back with more definition on how many and where, and, and we wanted to put some bounds around the EV agreement. And, and the agreement has not come back. It, it may come back. Up. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where it went. No, it, it hasn't, and I think one of our biggest challenges, as you know, we have park rules that have curfews uh, when parks are open and closed, uh, and originally Vista would like to see these charging stations used during non-peak hours, which are in some cases not during park hours, so that is a challenge from an enforcement um, type situation as well, and so I'd say right now that's one of the other biggest challenges that we have right at this moment as far as the, the time and use of those facilities, if they were on park land, how would we address the park hour rules in the SMC to accommodate that? So Garrett, is there a, right now, are any of the parks where these are tentatively slated to be installed, are they the same parks where we, are, we have the pilot for uh, no parking? Originally, Council Member Cathcart, we were looking at um, possible locations in Riverfront, Liberty Park adjacent to uh, the new library, and Shadle adjacent to the new library. A lot of this discussion was tied towards the construction of those libraries, if there was any advantage to tie in those charging stations while those, those projects were being constructed. Um, but to that point, we were only focusing on some of those uh, areas. And then golf courses was another uh, potential area uh, that was being investigated. As but well. place, places like Chief Gary or Coeur d'Alene, where we have those, the, the, the strict enforcement, you know, no parking after 10 p.m., the, those are not currently on the list for, for the EV? Okay. No. All right. Any other questions or comments from park board members or council members? All right, I'm not seeing one. Again, Park Board, you're one of the hardest working uh, boards out there. We really appreciate all your work and uh, commitment to the community and look forward uh, to further developments. I really like this uh, tact that you're taking about more engagement with the community and the friends of organizations and fleshing those out and the dog parks. And of course, we're getting very excited for uh, the 50 year anniversary for uh, Expo. So thanks for all that work. Take care, everyone. Thank you for your time. And then let us switch. We're going to talk a little bit on uh, American Rescue Plan. Uh, Matt B Boston actually has been uh, doing some amazing wrangling and cat herding to try to get these RFPs going a little faster. And so he's going to give us an update on a couple of them today. We're going to get more um, next week as well. But Matt, we'll turn it over to you. Before we start. Oh, before we start. <laughs> Matt, uh, I had a conversation with Steve McDonald today, so we want to talk to you about um, some of the things that we discussed last, you know, this, earlier this week. So just put that in the parking lot for now. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. And would you like me to kind of uh, talk about the, the issues that we've talked about on, on kind of a broader sense and then at the very least introduce the fact that we're looking going towards uh, hiring a project employee? No, I'm just working on the, the RFPs that are coming up, so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then that sounds like we're kind of narrowing this, down, this conversation down to two of the um, RFPs, of the, uh, the incentives that we have so far, and that's gonna be childcare and affordable housing um, as Council President said, uh, we've been doing a lot of discussions with all of the subcommittees and, and getting these RFPs out the door as, as soon as possible so that they benefit the community. Um, the two projects that we're talking about today, uh, both were allocated back on the 3rd of January of this year. 
uh, child care I'll start off with, and that is going to be the subcommittee that is led by um, Council Members Zapone and Wilkerson, and then um, for the administration side, Eric Finch. There's been several meetings um, internally with that group as well as um, with community members to, to try to understand the actual needs that are out there. I believe uh, two community outreach sessions were had with uh, different organizations to, to really fill out what exactly the need was. In the original narrative, um, there were three components that were um, the, the council was looking to accomplish uh, with these funds, and that was uh, capital as well as um, uh, capital as well as uh, vouchers for um, families that are needing child care for their children and then um, some, some staff-oriented spending, uh, whether that be retention or recruitment. Um, in those community outreach sessions, it was determined that uh, there, there is additional revenue sources that are out there for capital funding of child care facilities. So it was determined to actually take that initiative off and actually include the need for uh, mental health support within the child care facility. Um, I know there is a uh, RFP, or I'm sorry, an SBO that is coming forward uh, to increase this allocation um, from the original $1 million that was allocated back on the 3rd of January to uh, $3 million uh, to incorporate all of the needs being met. Uh, that is slated to be voted on Monday. Um, other than that, I, I will leave it open for questions, um, and I know uh, Council Member Sapone may chime in at any point. Yeah, Council Member, well, I'll let uh, Council Member Kath, uh, excuse me, Kinnear, uh, ask your question, but then I was going to look for a little more detail on the RFP components after that, but go ahead, Council Member Kinnear. Matt, thanks. Do you have uh, a running list of all the potential requests so that we're not over promising and under delivering okay is there any way that we all Absolutely. could have that so that we know yes um i think that would be actually pretty beneficial let me see if i can um, do it in, in a way that that's a little bit easier to digest um as we've gone through this process we've asked for community input, um, and we've received it from organizations, community members, um, and businesses alike. And um, some of them have been very, very robust in their request. Some of them have been minimal in their request and, and don't even um, necessarily meet the framework of the ARPA guidelines. So um, I, I'm happy to talk to the council uh, ARPA committee on, on Tuesday and see how best to present that to council, but I'm happy to do so. Thank you. Well, and at a minimum, we can get, these are the proposals that we've approved for monetary amounts of the amount so people know, and then these are the ones that we're talking about right now so that people kind of know that. And then the bigger list you're asking for is like everything that anyone's asked for. That's the board. I'm mm -hmm. concerned that there are not just requests, but promises being made right now, not necessarily by council. And I, I'm just getting nervous because okay. you think $80 million is a lot of money until it's not. And all of a sudden we've promised 90 million. It's not there. So just want to make sure that we're not overstepping our bounds. Absolutely. Um, last I checked, we were, um, in the high 20 million in terms of allocation so far, and that includes um, projects that are going to be, uh, that are gonna fit into the revenue replacement bucket, as well as uh, community outreach uh, initiatives. So I can, get, I can get that, but there shouldn't be any promises that are being made as there is kind of a standard protocol of um, the way that proposals need to be addressed and reviewed by council. Um, and, and without an allocation of an SBO, uh, there really can't be a promise, in my opinion. All right, so Council Member opponent, if you could tell us maybe a little more about what the components of the child care are. Yeah, well, yeah. So as we heard from Tanya last week, she was uh, uh, hopefully going to get us a 
RFP, but that did not come a contract. So we sent these general guidelines about it, and we're hoping they can get us to the details, which the guideline was like middle income earners, and then we sent over the table of what the state's doing, and that there's a gap between now and 2025 is when the state kicks in. So we don't have the specific details, but that's the general idea. Okay. So I, and then maybe now is a good idea, like if that idea is not working, then we could kick it back to them and be like, can you modify this general idea is not working with council, the rest of council. So it was really around flexibility of the staffing. They wanted to be able to hire um, additional staff members, depending on different providers and what, they, what their needs were. But if they needed that or to alleviate stress on other staff, uh, whether it's a floater, a floating position, an extra person, um, they all stressed that they, we need a regional mental health coordinator position that would serve multiple providers um, and like coach them up and help support them. They said that we have one right now for the region and they would really see a, an additional person for that. Um, so that was the flexibility on the staffing, the mental health, and then the vouchers. Uh, it's probably not as much detail <laughs> as you're hoping, <laughs> but that's, so we, we can take the feedback. Okay. Uh, Council Member Cathcart. Yeah, I guess, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm generally supportive, I, but the part that I am, where I'm a little stuck and I, I want to get some more clarity on is the mental health aspect. And because uh, I feel like, I mean, there's a lot of professions, there's a lot of folks who are, you know, frontline workers through COVID. There's a lot of folks that sort of, you could argue, might need mental health. So why this one industry and not the, the many others that we could argue on the mental health side? But it's, it's helping for the, the kids. It, so it's a, it trains the staff to be better trauma-informed caretakers of the kids. Okay, because I was told this was to, to, to treat staff. Not, that, that's what was shared with me, was that this is oh, for treating staff. That was not my understanding. Sorry. Okay, so that's yeah. very different. If, if anyone else heard more. That's well, very different. I, we got to see what they come back with from the administration, because I, 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 I tend to agree with you, okay. Council Member, yeah. that it's like, all right, if there's a targeted piece, but w what does that mean? And, and I think, I mean, I've gone to groups in the industry and they've talked about a array of mental health supports yeah. and have included both what you said and what you said. And so we're okay. trying to narrow it down to okay. what council wants to do gotcha. with these funds. Yeah. And then um, Matt, Boston, I see your hands raised. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I mean, um, the way that the memo has been laid out from uh, council to the, the committee, the subcommittee that's actually uh, developing the parameters of this project, it really sounds like um, it, it's focused more towards um, the children that they provide care for. Um, and, and really that was explicitly stated out um, within the Department of Treasury guidance that there's, there's this own category uh, under the negative economic impact of addressing addressing educational disparities, mental health services. So it's, it's those children that are within the educational range that have been um, very impacted, obviously, by, by the pandemic and, and all that it's brought. So I, I, I believe that it's focused towards the children, um, but that's, that's just my understanding. All right, want to go to the housing. So we're going to do sub-area planning next week. We were going to do it this week, but we need a little more time, but we're going to do that next week. We, we don't need time. We just don't have Spencer here. Okay. Yeah. So anyways. Well, but the vouchers I was going to ask, because originally you yeah. had the idea of newly employed employees. So yeah. this direction's moving okay with folks. Well, let's see what it, the RFP says, oh, and yeah. then, then we'll wordsmith it. But yeah, I, what Zach's bringing up is originally we had talked about vouchers to fill a gap for newly employed people to pay 100% of their first month, 50% of their second, third, while they're, while they're getting their income in, that was the thing. What the community groups were saying is, well, that's, that is something, but there's this bigger, wider gap of uh, families until the state's new program in 2025 comes in. So let's, let's provide vouchers more broadly than just people who have just gotten employment. But a lot of that's going to have to do with how much money there is and that. So I'd say we wait till we see what that language and then we can wordsmith that. Yeah. And there, there was a concern that even if they become newly employed, they might have to leave the workforce even if they started working. So, right. And, and some people who are there now might leave because they're just above the threshold. Because there's like lower income threshold and then like that middle yeah. threshold. So that was the idea around it. Yeah. So 
we'll see. All right, but the other one that we've <laughs> been really trying to get out is the uh, affordable, the gap funding for affordable housing projects. And I think, give, give us the, where we are on that. I think we're getting darn close, like we're just about to issue it. Absolutely. And, and just if I may uh, touch on, on the, uh, the child care piece, just that last conversation that you we were having, I, I, I don't think that we um, need to have one exclusive without the other. Um, I think really we can, in the RFP, we, we can put together um, the wording, just like you said, you know, just kind of wordsmithing it there, where there are two phases of the program. There is the, the, there is the employee onboard phase of the program, and then there is the ongoing maintenance uh, phase of the program to help child, child, uh, the child care incentive. So that's the only um, touch that I would add on that. But um, next is affordable housing. Um, this, this group was uh, Council President Beggs, uh, Brian McClatchy, uh, Jen Teresides, and George Dahl. Uh, Jen Teresides and George Dahl did an excellent job with the heavy lifting on getting this uh, out the door. Um, they did a great job at, at kind of combining uh, the funds to create the most, the max impact for the community. Um, this is going to be in conjunction with our $1,406 to net out to a total of $9.5 million of award that's going out there. As Council President said, um, the incentive is to have um, this, this RFP uh, issued today, um, which is April 28th, and that's on their timeline, unless there's any sort of discrepancies that come up uh, during this conversation. Um, I'm just interrupting you. It, really, it's 1406 and 1590. So for people, and it's it's the, the gap funding piece. Existing projects that just need to be topped up and could get done. So. Great. I apologize. Yep. Um, so the way that they have this uh, proposal is to have uh, workshops, technical assistance workshops for the uh, beneficiaries that are going to be out there. Um, this is, you know, at the end of the day, to provide more affordable housing for our community citywide. Um, the workshops are slated to be the 4th and the 10th, so the next uh, few weeks, and then uh, a close of applications due by the end of May, um, and then um, issue by uh, issue and contracting by July, August of this year. Um, hoping to impact at least part of the 2022 building season. Um, this is going to obviously fit easily into the uh, long-term housing security, affordable housing, uh, which is the expenditure category laid out by the Department of Treasury, um, and then as well as uh, the 15, uh, the 14, sorry, the 1406 and the 1590 as well. <laughs> Happy to take any questions on this. Councilmember Cathcart. Yeah. So, to your knowledge, is this structured? Um to only be focused on gap funding? Are there home ownership uh, opportunities, provisions, and then is it open to both for-profit and non-profit to uh, potentially apply? So open to for-profit and non-profit um, per the RFP that they have written so far. Um, it is, uh, I, I believe um, there is an incentive towards um, home ownership and uh, I believe you had one other question. What, what was the well, last? I just, I apologize. Is it just fo is is it mostly focused on gap funding, or is it broader broader than that? I guess it, it's broader. Um, let me just get it, to that. Page. The way I would characterize it is it's broader in terms of anyone can apply for anything, but the f emphasis is gap funding. Okay. So we're letting people know that you know in the future, fifteen ninety is going to be used more right. broadly, but the intent at this point on the ARPA piece is the, is the gap funding, and we're kind of sharing that on the 1590-1406 portion of this package. Gotcha. Gap funding is the emphasis, but anyone can apply for any fund, and private, nonprofit. I think there's some other programs that we're hoping for ARPA that will come forward that will emphasize home ownership more than this, okay. but um, it's not limited to that. Anyone and so do that. If, a, if a private... Uh, builder developer said you know hey I'm, I'm building this 100 unit apartment complex i can make a certain number of these units affordable could they sort of apply for some dollars to sort of compensate in terms of making it affordable would that be kind of within the realm of this rfp 
I mean, yes, uh, there, there are uh, a, a list of um, uh, qualifications that a uh, developer would actually need to, to hit this, um, affordable housing being one of them, also um, hitting the target populations that are out there. I mean, uh, persons with disabilities, veterans, senior citizens, et cetera, there's, there's a list um, that, that, that would be checked off and, and then um, following the scoring matrix um, would be how the funds are, are actually shelled out. Okay. And I'll just say, Michael, I think in the future for 1590 in particular, I'm really hoping that we'll figure that out. I think it would be unlikely in this round just the way projects are generally funded in that. But I really like the idea of down the road that we could say, hey, builder, if you're going to build 50 units, we'll buy right. five of them. Yeah and make them permanently affordable and we'll give you money up front to do so I hope we create that model I don't think this is likely it, it's they're not precluded but it's just not as user friendly so I, I it's exactly what I want and it, you get the mixed use and the mixed incomes mixed and so income is the real yeah so I'm I really hope that we go down that direction okay. but Councilmember Kinnear had a question before I interrupted what's the mechanism for making sure that the builders are going to adhere to that uh, affordable model I'm guessing it's in perpetuity right and well maybe 40 years or okay so that's yeah for our purposes yeah. but the other piece is so you've got let's say your scenario where you have got uh, maybe a quarter of them affordable and three quarters are market rate is there a way to make sure that the affordable um, units are going to be maintained at the same level that the market rate units will be maintained. So we don't have a rent control situation where a landlord won't maintain because they aren't making money, enough money back to, to do so. So I'll jump in, Matt. <laughs> guess, guess, but. So in the, in the scenario that uh, Councilmember Cathcart and I were talking about, the city would fund the money for a nonprofit to purchase those units and they would manage them like any other nonprofit that manages affordable units. Um, and so it wouldn't be left to the, you know, so that would be their mission. And then, but in terms of how you make sure that this money is spent on permanently affordable or 40 year, it's gonna be the same mechanisms we use for, for all NFTs our projects. Or, yeah, it, okay. it's, it's all of it. Okay, got it. So. It is a cost of monitoring. One of the things the department was interested in is like, okay. Yeah. So there's a piece of the money we're allocating that the department has to hold back for administrative. Yeah. Any other questions on this one? Mm -hmm. All right, well, just keep us posted. And I will say George Dahl uh, has reached out and he is uh, really in the minutia with this. So if you have any kind of detailed questions, uh, please feel free to feel free to reach out to him directly. Yeah. And again, I think based on um, some of the work Matt has done the last couple of weeks of being a cat herder, I th we'll be seeing more of these more regularly uh, uh, for the first two tranches. And then the other thing, just as a preview for next week, uh, there's some discu discussion, I've sent out some emails around this, of a couple of projects of trying to get them done earlier, not the RFP, but just tranche three. We've been saying we're going to do tranche three for several things that people have been talking about uh, as soon as we got a few of these RFPs, but there's some deadlines coming up. So we might discuss that next Thursday for a potential vote on the 9th. So just to stay tuned for that. Okay. You're not going to be here on the 9th. I know, but I would, I, I may be here for, <laughs> for a vote. Okay. Okay. If needed. Okay. If the RFP is done today on the housing, can we get that sent out? That'd be great. If we yeah. Can see that. Yeah. To council. Just. To I was informed. It's in the past. Uh, by George, oh, that the, oh, okay. the timeline on this is actually um, in a draft format. I don't believe that the the RFP will be issued today, um, but I believe it's in the very near future. I'll get you a. I'll get the council a date um, as soon as possible. But the draft is in the packet. So. Okay. It is. Yeah. And for, just for your guys' awareness, next week we have the playground projects, eviction defense, and sub-area planning that we'll be discussing. Next week? Yep. So we'll just keep cycling them through every Thursday. We'll have a few. Yep. Yeah. So. Okay. 
Anything else? All right. Well, uh, thanks, everyone. We're adjourned, and we'll see you on Monday. <laughs>